Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 232 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Rennie. You can get the show notes at continuefit.com. It's where you can get information on all my podcasts, my show, Strength Coach TV, and now my new coaching program. So you can check that out at continuefit.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about his progression for the hand clean. I was kind of had some questions about that based off of his new product, uh, Complete Youth Training. Talked about some of the different phases that he uh, prescribes the hang clean, as well as uh, the behavioral change model that Precision Nutrition uses uh, when they want to talk about some of the nutrition habits for uh, not only children, but adults. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness, Sigmund Allen Cosgrove is on to talk about it's none of your business making sure you keep it professional in regards to other uh, fitness facilities or trainers. For the functional movement system segment, Greg Rose is on to talk about flying dogs and predicting injury with the FMS, an interesting one that got a lot of talk on social media recently. For the Train Heroic data-driven coaching segment, Adam Doughty talks to Tim Robinson again about using data to build relationships. Good stuff there. For the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach segment, I have on PJ Nessler. He's the Performance Director for Extreme Performance Training, which is XPT. It's it's Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese's company. Uh, And he is doing some great things there. We're talking about performance breathing, what their movement curriculum looks like. They spent a lot of time in the pool. Wanted to talk to him about that. Some recovery methods, including recovery breathing. Also, going a little deeper into cold and heat exposure. Great stuff from PJ coming up in a little while. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering questions. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? All right, all right. Uh, We're coming off of the uh, the big launch week uh, for complete youth training, and a lot of people, uh, lots of positive feedback, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah, it actually went very, very well, which was which was great. I mean, I, uh, as I said to you before, I was really excited about this from a product standpoint. The one thing I think with this is I think this one will have more staying power than any of the other things, because I think there'll be more people saying, Hey, this was really good. You should see it, which I don't know. I think the other ones were kind of faster, sort of a little more here and gone, but I think this is something that'll be around for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. And you know, I think, uh, uh, something like uh, all all of the research that you were talking about that's really not going anywhere. It's uh, so so I think it's it's going to be important for for trainers to be able to talk to parents as well. When that that's what we talked about originally in the in the, that last episode was just about how 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 much parent education and how how involved we need to be with with some of the parents because really that's who we're communicating with. Yeah, and and it's funny there was just another I uh, um there was another NBA one talking about NBA guys who were multi sport athletes growing up have lower injury rates. I mean, the the evidence will not stop mounting. I will guarantee that for people that there'll be more and more of these things where people will look and say it, it just makes way too much sense. Yeah, and I think you're going to see because especially over the last few years about how many of these kids you know, only, you know, specialized and, and how, uh, you know, we're going to see them kind of falling by the wayside. Whereas, you know, maybe over the last seven or eight years, how, you know, this has gotten to be such big business and, and, it, you know, the pendulum has swung so far that way that we will see, uh, we'll see it come back. 
Exactly. Coach, let's talk about the hand clean because it's funny because I have a kid. I'm still training uh, a young hockey player, and I taught him. I, I originally taught him how to to clean, but I I kind of use Will Fleming's method of uh, more of like a six step. And I wanted to talk to you about this, like the hip hinge first, then a hinge to a jump. Then the scarecrow, which is kind of like the high pole, I guess it would be called. Uh, the front squat. Then the high bar drop, which is that scarecrow position, and they drop under a bar. It's something that you used to use with a, a racked bar in, in one of your older videos from the 90s, teaching the Olympic lifts. And then get to the clean. And you teach a three-step position, which was uh, hands-free front squat, then the front squat you know, just so they can grasp that catch position, then you kind of get them into that position one with their, you know, the curled hands into squeezing the shoulder blades, bent knees, and just, you know, do it. Now, my question for you really is, are you trying to, um, is it different for maybe like if if like a 17, 18 year old, are you going to be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, um, more, more instruction or is it like, is this going to be three step with, with, with just, like with everybody now, or is like, cause they, we're trying to just make it easy. That's what I guess I'm trying to get at. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be, it's basically three step. Although sometimes in all honesty, if we get someone who's a better athlete, we might start at step three and just bang, jump, catch. Like, okay. You know, let's get it. And then if we think, okay, we've got to go back to one and two. And sometimes it's interesting you say that. Cause that's one of the things I have to reemphasize with the staff a lot is that, Hey, let's go through the progression because I do think that hands-free front squat is really important because getting somebody to understand that you don't receive the bar in your hands is really central to them understanding the lift and being able to ever get good at the lift because people, when you watch people who don't clean well, they're standing there holding the bar in their hands. And so I think you've got to get that hands-free front squat and then get them to understand front squat. And then from there, I always think it's like jump, catch in the front squat. That's all, you know, I tell people all the time, just think about it. jump up in the air, catch it in the front squat. And it's amazing how fast you might look at someone and go like, yeah, that's it. Good job. <laughs> I, really you're, fun. you're a hundred percent right. It's uh, that. And I kind of like, I think that's, oh, that's better for most of the people because you're taking away some of the instruction. We're talk too much. Right. And that's what I think, you know, when some people like I've seen all kinds, I mean, I've literally seen, and we've got a, we've got a couple articles in the site up about it. Jeff Jeff Johnson had one, and I think oh my god, what was the guy's name? He's Olympic. Um, at Leo Totten, I think there's one on there that we posted on the site, and it's amazing how complex some people can make it in terms of the number of steps. And I'll see some people say, oh, you know, I take a whole semester, you know, and we teach deadlift, and then we teach this, and then we teach that. And I'm kind of like, geez, I can take a 12 year old and then, you know, I could get him cleaning in two days. Like, I don't need a whole semester. Yeah. <laughs> me, so, me and Mark look good. They both look good on that. Yeah. And that's what's interesting is the other thing in this, I forget who I was talking to the other day, but there was something that I was either talking to somebody or they were reading, talking about repetition. And a lot of it is just, especially with kids, it's just exposure and reps and doing it there. We talked about it in the presentation. Kids are very experiential. And it, did you ever read, remember I talked to you about um, Most Likely to Succeed? No, did you, I didn't read that. So I love it. It was my favorite book of last year. But one of the things that the guy talked about in Most Likely to Succeed, he does a little, um, he has a little part in there about uh, if they taught riding, uh, bicycle riding in school, what it would be like. And, and he talks about the fact that yeah, you know, everybody would know how to spell derailleur and everybody would know, you know, how many sprockets there were on the gear and everybody would know, you know, how many, you know, how many shifts you had to make to get, you know, from low gear to high gear and everybody could spell derailleur and, you know, knew the pressure of tires. He said, but no one would be able to ride a bike. And, and I, it was really like, you're like, he's absolutely right. Like if they make this like into a class, you know, no one's doing it. It's like, you know, whereas if you just give them a bar and like show them, okay, that's why we put so much emphasis in this, even like CFSC, everything, your ability to demonstrate, like if you can't do the stuff, you're not going to be able to teach it because the world is getting more and more visual now all the time. Just because of, I mean, we were talking about this today in training. We had our girls group. We were talking about things, you know, people were saying they, Oh, I learned how to do that on YouTube. I learned how to do that on YouTube where people just go and watch <clears throat> We were talking about Michaela learned to braid hair watching YouTube. 
and she can do French braids. Like she can literally braid like a hairstylist wow. and it's wow. all from YouTube. And so <clears throat> the kids are way more visual than they've ever been. And so it's like, show them, let them do it. The more reps you get, like I said, you look at Mark and Mia and you think, wow, 13 years old, they're pretty good Olympic lifters. Well, they're pretty good Olympic lifters because two days a week they go in and they do cleans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Mike, it's nothing magic. Yeah, Mike, a question about the hands-free front squat, though. One issue that I had with Dante was, um, like, he doesn't have, like, the delts aren't really that developed. So he was kind of feeling like it's going on his throat. And what are, what are some things that you've kind of found? Well, f- one of the things, that? that's why we use like the 15 pound aluminum bar. Cause it doesn't feel that bad. Okay. And I always tell everybody it should be, it should be uncomfortably against your throat. You should feel it against your throat in a way where you think, I don't really like this. Okay. But not, you know, when someone says to me, Oh, it's pressing on my throat. I can't breathe. I look at him and said, yes, you can. Because if you couldn't breathe, you wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> you just don't like Yeah. Because no one, you know, even if you put your finger on somebody's throat like that, no one likes that. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it's not, you know, you don't look at him and think, you know, you're not turning blue. You're not getting asphyxiated. You've just got a little bit of pressure there against your larynx or whatever that is. And okay. and you'll be okay. But it does get them to realize, okay, i got to roll that thing up on my on my deltoids and I've got to get that, those elbows to come up and people talk about, you know, making a shelf or there's a million, that's why I said it is so many different teaching methods, but the one commonality, you know, whether it's Will's method or whether it was uh, the Jeff Johnson article or whatever it is, is top down where people are teaching the receiving position before the pulling. And I think that's the, that's one of the biggest things is like, if you teach somebody, okay, they, here's where it's supposed to land. And then you get in the right load where it's like jump and catch. It, you know, it goes back to the, you know, people say, oh, the Olympic lifts are hard to teach. I'm like, yeah, we, we teach kids. We teach lots of kids to Olympic lift every year. And it is not hard to teach. Do you have any mobility issues? Well, Dante had some, uh, you know, he's playing all the time. He's a baseball player and a hockey player. And uh, he, uh, he had some mobility issues. Like, I, you know, but he was kind of shocked at how much. Even yesterday, like when he when he well, I gave him a few stretches the first time I taught him that okay you got to do those stretches you know pre Olympic pre uh, cleaning how how much better he was he felt when he did it. Do you have any yeah, issues? Yeah, that? we do sometimes, but I think a lot of times too it's more where kids say oh I can't get my hands in this position, and then you kind of grab all as they grab their fingers and put their fingers on their shoulders and say yes you can. Okay. Yeah. And kind of look and go oh, you're right. And, I think there's a relatively small number of people, 10%, who really can't do it, and those are people that we teach to snatch. And then there's probably another 20 or 30% who say they can't do it, but in reality they can. Yeah. Coach, you had um, I, I, in the program, in phase one, it was hang clean progression. Phase two, hang clean from position one. And then phase three, hang clean. But you didn't in the program. It didn't elaborate specifically, or I didn't see it anyway. On the hang clean progression, what will you do? Will you just make them do like five uh, hands for your front squats, five front squats, and then get into the clean? Exactly. Or? Yep, that's exactly okay. what we do. Is just those are as learning. And actually, I think I don't know if Pat ended up sending them out. I sent him a couple of bonus videos where we actually put that in because that was one of the things I realized wasn't in the program. And so I sent him a bonus video about teaching the hand clean and I sent him another one about doing your first chin up because I felt like that's the other thing you look at Mark and me and you think they could do chin ups but people are like well I got kids who can't do chin ups what do I do so we kind of went through holds and eccentrics and bands and it was interesting because I actually have to I got to send it to you Sean uh, Skane published a blog post that I wanted to reprint on the site that he said that we could but one of the things he said is I've stopped using bands for chin ups because I don't think I don't think they work and my thing was that I don't think bands work by themselves, but I think as part of the formula they do. So we've realized that there's sort of this combination of just holds above the bar, eccentric lowers and bands. And when you kind of combine all of those, you end up with a bunch of people that can do chin-ups, which is what we always have. Okay, cool. And you know what? Another thing I noticed on the bottom of the program 
Uh, I guess it's kind of like that precision nutrition idea of teaching concepts. You know, phase one, they had to answer the question, did I eat before training? Phase two, did I eat breakfast? Phase three, did I hydrate? So you're waiting. Like, that's just the first thing you're trying to teach them. Like, hey, guys, this is phase one. All we wanted you to do is focus on, make sure you eat before training. Yep. That's all. Like, I, and that, I, I love that precision. I'm such a huge kind of John Berardi fan in that regard. Yeah. In, I think John has done something incredibly brilliant in the world of nutrition, which is recognizing that this is a behavior modification problem and not a nutrition problem. It's kind of like when it's things like Gray used to say years ago in terms of, you know, don't bring a mobility solution to a stability problem. And it's kind of like don't bring a nutrition solution to a behavioral problem. And I think sometimes we get really caught up in kind of the macro, micronutrient thing and trying to kind of solve that problem and not looking at it and realizing, oh, wait a second, and that's not really our problem. Our problem is we've got to get some behaviors in place here that are going to allow us to be successful. Agreed. Good stuff. Uh, like I said, it's such, I just think that's such an incredibly good uh, – just process. Yeah, I like the way you did tr eating before training and you have in phase three hydration because a lot of people would say, let's get this hydration done right away. But I think, you know, we're trainers. Like that's what we're focused on right now. We're thinking, hey, guys, this is what's really going to help you. Let's get you to eat before training. Yeah. And, and that's where I think, you know, when you look at that, like for us, that's kind of that's what we do with everybody. And that's the stuff that we're trying to. And we very much adopted that sort of Berardi-esque Berardi idea of, okay, what's our biggest problem? Let's try to create a solution for that first as opposed to, um, I don't know, like I guess just getting things out of like hydration. I mean, I don't know. And again, it's not that it's not a big deal, but are these kids really dehydrated? Are they really not drinking water or whatever? Or, or, or do we have a larger problem that we need to deal with initially? Yeah, it's funny because Dante said to me yesterday, I was going over some nutrition concepts as well. And he's like, yeah, I, hate, I don't really like breakfast. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable. But it's, it's, but I always said that's the standard answer because when someone says that I don't really like breakfast, I always look at them and think that I didn't. That wasn't a question. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like that, that, that wasn't the question. I, I didn't say, do you like breakfast? It's like we're just telling you you need to eat breakfast. And, yeah. and I go through that with parents all the time. When they say stuff like, oh, my kid doesn't like to do this. And I'm like, you know, what if he liked to do coke? Yeah. You, know, you can't like these. This is not how you make decisions in terms of, you know, oh, yeah, he doesn't like that. I mean, I, you know, I get it. OK, there's maybe foods that he doesn't like and you have to realize. But again, from a behavior modification standpoint, particularly with a kid who tells you, like, I, I had that conversation years ago with a, a wide receiver who was going down to Brown. He was talking to you know, talking all the talk about how strong you want to get. I want to do this. I want to run this. I want to get lean. And then he's like, yeah, but I don't, I don't really like breakfast. And I would say to people, no, you don't, you don't like getting up. Cause yeah. I, you know, I, you know, I go back kind of to the Mark Verstegen idea about that. Something is better than nothing. Well, if you don't like breakfast, eat lunch. Just do it at seven o'clock before you go to school. I don't care what you eat. <laughs> yeah. You get up and think, Oh, I don't like eggs. I don't want, okay, great. Have a ham sandwich for all I care. Just get up and eat. And, you know, that, I remember Todd, I remember Todd Wright was saying that at one of his talks years ago with one of his guys, you know, I, I don't like breakfast, you know, like, would you eat a, would you eat a pop tart? The kids like, yeah, I need a pop tart. Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get up in the morning, going to eat a pop tart. And some of the, you know, the, the freaking, you know, the Tupperware people were horrified, you know, the, who, who had their broccoli and chicken, you know, in their bag. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's like, but I got to get a kid who doesn't eat breakfast to eat so like I need him to put calories in his system in the morning and if it's a pop tart great he yeah. just you know I got you know from a behavior modification standpoint I just modified a behavior yeah I got a guy who didn't eat in the morning to eat in the morning and I think that's as I said that to me and you know this sounds like a precision nutrition ad but I feel like that's the brilliance of what John's been able to do is to be able to just completely alter the lens of what we're doing and realize like, don't worry about all the bullshit about, you know, 
is it, you know, baked chicken, you know, is the skin on, you know, what it's like, no, no, no. We got way bigger things to deal with than that. Yeah. yeah. From a baby. If we get these kids to start drinking booze, then they wake up a little hangover to love bacon and eggs in the morning. Right, exactly. There you go. See this now. Now you, now you're thinking. You Talk about. Like, you sound like Michael Keaton in Night Shift. Yeah, yeah. Talk about behavior change. Um, all right. Well, on that note, Coach, we're gonna let you go. So thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ed. I always appreciate it. All right, hey guys, right now, Perform Better, there is free shipping on orders over $59. Combine that with some sale items, you got some pretty good deals. Restrictions do apply, so check it out for more info. The summits are here. Actually, this weekend, I'm speaking in Orlando on Sunday morning, 8 o'clock. Uh, it's going from Thursday to Sunday, but then there's Providence on June 29th to July 1st, Chicago, July 27th to the 29th, and Long Beach, August 17th to the 19th. Check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Business of Fitness section here on the Strength Coach Podcast, where we try to give you some ideas, strategies, and mindset training to help you make a little bit more of your money in your fitness business. So this week, the lesson is, It is none of your business. Never, ever, ever, under any exception, talk poorly about the competition or anyone else. If someone comes in and they tell you they had a bad experience with another gym, you tell them, yeah, those guys suck over there. It stinks. They're terrible. That does nothing to raise the standards. What if you responded with, I'm sorry, I hate for anyone to have a bad experience with fitness. Right? That means you're taking ownership of it as the ambassador for the industry. And it's not about who's talking bad about who else, right? It's, it's never, it's, as hard as it can be sometimes, especially when you see all these videos of exercise fails and bad trainers out there, as hard as it can be, start to join in the bad mouthing. You'll have to bite your tongue and walk away, right? And I know it's hard. I, I bet you've seen a bad exercise video posted on Facebook or somewhere on social media of a bad trainer or bad form in an exercise class. But I bet it was probably posted by another trainer. Well done, guys. We're destroying our own industry from the inside, right? So if you take responsibility like that, I'm sorry, I hate for anyone to have a bad experience with fitness, you'll surprise your prospect or your client by taking responsibility for the entire industry. That sets you totally apart from the competition and, and demonstrates like your complete like moral integrity and your professionalism. Anytime you talk negatively about anyone, it just reflects poorly on you and it makes it seem to some degree that you have an insecurity or at some level threatened by that other gym. And you're not, so don't join in. Uh, we've had other gyms in, in our area start rumors about us. We had a, a gym around the corner start rumors that we were about to go out of business and they say negative things and you know, at some level, you take it as a compliment because you must be a threat. If they're talking about you and focused on you, I'm not even thinking about them. I don't really know what they're doing. I choose not to, to care, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about, you know, someone behind me. And when we first opened way back in 2000, we learned this lesson right away. And we opened the gym we had a, and left another local gym. And all the trainers we worked with started to talk negatively about us and we weren't going to be successful. And, you know, at the time... As a young trainer, like, I was upset about it because I'd never said anything negative about them. But when they left, they all seemed excited for us. And, you know, when our backs were turned, it changed. I was telling one of our clients about it. I and mean, she's a very successful business owner. It was sort of a mentor to me at the time. And as, as I was opening up about the situation, she just put her hand down and shook my hand and goes, welcome to success. You've arrived. And it just flipped my head. as that she didn't want to hear about it. She was just just pointing out, if people are talking about you, it's because you're something to talk about. And whether they're insecure, jealous, or threatened by what you're doing, that's none of your business either. Stay focused on what you're doing through your own four walls, guys. Uh, any questions or follow-ups on this, jump over into the, the business section, the Strength Coach Forum, or reach out to me on social media with any questions at uh, the facebook.com, uh, uh, Alan Cosgrove uh, Fitness Coaching page, uh, and I'll hit you up there. All right, see you guys next time.
Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. And we're here with the Train Heroic Data Driven Coaching segment. Today, Tim, I want to talk about your career in collegiate strength conditioning, awesome. which was about eight years long. Eight years. Right. So I know you've worked with different coaches and different schools, and you've had some good experiences and some bad ones. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it was your fault. That's it correct. You know, if you meet jerks all day, you're probably the jerk. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right. So not saying you're a jerk, but you Thank can you. always do work to build better relationships. Correct. All right. So I know early on in your career, you had some struggles as a new strength conditioning coach yeah. with, you know, coaches not trusting you and not letting you do your thing. Yep. So tell me about how that happened. Yeah. So, um, you know, early on I was green. I didn't have a lot of experience and a, and a baseball coach came into the weight room and, and he was uh, pretty adamant on not training shoulders. And I had a plan, uh, all, all, you know, created for the guys. And, um, you know, I had to adjust because because he's the boss, and that really kind of hurt my hurt my ego. But I didn't do a good job communicating or creating a relationship with that coach, so he didn't trust me. There was no baseline of trust there. Right. So he did he have any insight into your plan at all? No, none. I mean, I didn't. I, I was a horrible communicator. Right. So you had a plan, it, it, you know, in your mind and on paper. Because I know you're an organized guy. Yeah. But you didn't really you didn't do well at saying letting him know that you had thought about all this. Not at all. All right. Yeah. So that obviously doesn't help your relationship. So no. now tell me about how you did differently later on and how that was better. Yeah. So later in my career as a head strength coach, um, I would make it a point to sit down with each and every sport coach, go through our 52 week plan. Really? Uh, kind 52 of, weeks? 52 every weeks, week? Every week. Yep. And uh, we would we would talk about what the expectations of the athletes were on that week. And I would utilize the simplest tools, phone calls, emails, text messages. How great are text messages? And I would check with that coach to see how those athletes are doing. Uh, to make sure the training is is on par with their thoughts, and that builds trust. And then I got a little more leeway in in the weight room. It was great. Right. So you're always going to be serving the strength, the sport coach, rather. You are. That's just how strength conditioning works. Yep. But as you gain more trust, they just kind of believe more that you would do the right thing for them and their athletes. Absolutely. That's great. Yep. So now tell me a little bit about how you might use data to strengthen this relationship. Yeah. So, you know, how, how what do the numbers say? Right. How do you use that? You got to be able to show people evidence. Right. Um, and I have a great example. I was training a football team, right? And we were, we were slow and the head coach knew we were slow. And he told me that he wanted us to be faster overall team speed. Um, so I said, okay, we did some benchmark testing, took some forties, flying forties, some conditioning tests. Um, and slowly throughout the spring season, um, over a course of four weeks, we trained speed two days a week. We got in there, we did lateral speed. We did, you know, um, vertical speed, moving forward, moving backwards, all of those components, and we got faster. It passed the eye test. We were fast in spring ball. And our numbers, it showed that we had gotten better and we had improved in team speed. Right. So what happened then? Like what, what effect did that have? Uh, the head coach fell in love with me and he kind of backed off a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's a real uh, sweet story, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening today. You can go to trainheroic.com to start your 14-day free trial. And when you're talking to one of our team members, be sure to tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off the Pro or Elite Edition. Hey guys, it's Dr. Greg Rose here. I'm going to do something that I normally don't do. Um, I usually don't respond to things that drive me crazy, but this is one of these things that's been driving me crazy for 10 years and something came across my desk. I saw an article from a very high respected journal, an evidence-based study, and I just can't take it anymore. So basically what I'm referring to is I just saw another article that said the functional movement screen, the FMS, does not predict injury. If I hear that one more time, I think I'm going to explode. Basically, here's the bottom line. FMS has been saying for at least 10 years, probably 20 years, that it doesn't predict injury. That's not what it's for, right? I'd say like the analogy would be this. It's imagine somebody said, hey, I heard that uh, dogs can fly. So they heard dogs can fly. Now, can dogs fly? No, dogs can't fly. But for some reason, a researcher heard dogs can fly, so they decided to go do a research project. They get a bunch of dogs, they go to the top of a building, they drop these dogs off a building, and lo and behold, dogs don't fly. They give it to a journal, a very respected journal, and the journal goes, hey, interesting, you did a study to see that dogs can't fly, and for somehow it gets across the IRB and gets published. But if you would have actually gone and talked to people who own dogs, people who use dogs, people who love dogs, they would tell you, don't drop them off a building, they'll die, dogs don't fly. They don't go ask people who actually use the FMS, what's this for? They just make this assumption that FMS can fly, dogs can fly. It's the dumbest assumption I've ever heard. If you had any competency in math, you would know this. Like, let's just take, for example, the FMS, for you guys that don't know, is seven tests. And those tests are scored, zero, one, two, or three. Zero, it hurts. One, they can't do it. Two, it's acceptable. Three, it's optimal. 
Let's take an example of somebody with seven tests that has optimal movement in six. They have six threes, but they have pain in one of these. They're already injured, right? That person, because they have six threes and a zero, they're an 18. Their total score is an 18. Let's take somebody who has all seven tests. It's, it's acceptable. All their movements are acceptable. They get twos in all of them. They're a 14. Anybody with any math skills will be able to show you that an 18 doesn't mean your less chance of getting injured or pain. This person's already in pain. The lower score is better here, right? So the last thing in the world you'd ever do is a research paper on total score predicting injury. That's not what it's for, right? Yes, some people, some people will say, oh, I've heard FMS, though, has done studies saying that it can predict injury. I heard that you said that dogs can fly. The only thing you've ever seen, if you look at the journals, is that you've seen that there's been an NFL study or some studies where it says that if you get below a 14, that you probably have some issues. Well, if you're below a 14, guess what? You have zeros or ones. If you have zeros or ones, if you want to do research about zeros or ones, let's do research on zeros or ones that can create injury because they're already injured. The zeros are already injured. They have pain. No one ever said the higher you go, the better. That doesn't make any sense. So if you say, hey, total score can't predict injury, well, of course it can't. Dogs can't fly. Another thing that's really important is perceived competency. You know, one thing that we know at, at FMS is that if I ask you, hey, uh, can you squat? And you say, yeah, I can squat. And I say, hey, does it hurt? And you say, no, it wouldn't hurt. You're predicting your competency. If you say you can squat and you say it doesn't hurt versus I take somebody and I say, do you think you can squat? And they say, no, I can't squat. And you say, do you think it would hurt? They say, yeah, it does hurt. There are two types of people. There are people who believe they're competent and people who believe they are not competent. Here's the funny thing. If you know you're not competent, if you know you can't squat and won't hurt, you're probably less likely to squat. So you're probably less likely to get hurt squatting. Whereas if you think you can squat, but let's say you're not great at squatting, you're probably a higher risk. So actually perceived competency probably has more to do with injury. But injury is a complete profile. We can't just take a, a movement screen and predict injury. That doesn't make any sense. That's literally saying dogs can fly. It drives me crazy that a evidence-based journal, a very well-respected journal, how this could get across their RMB, across their desk. I would tell you right now, any researcher from now on that says FMS doesn't predict injury, you shouldn't read any of the research. They obviously don't study what they're researching. And I'd even challenge the journal for even publishing that. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So you should ask yourself is, what are dogs for? What's the FMS for? Well, let me tell you what the FMS is for. If I go to, let's say, take in my role at TPI, from my golf role, at TPI, we use the functional movement screen. What's the functional movement screen? It's a movement screen. We're trying to predict movement, not injury. It's pretty good at this, right? So we predict this movement. This movement can not only help me determine an exercise program, so I can kind of know which exercises would be appropriate for you, but what it's really good is I call it movement patterns. I can actually look at, like, let's say the overhead deep squat. That's one of the greatest predictors of what happens to your posture in your golf swing. We have a huge correlation of predicting a movement pattern problem with the FMS and predicting a movement pattern in your golf swing. We do this with all sports. We do this in our tennis programs. We do this in our baseball programs. Movement screens are for movement. Injury is a whole different ballgame. If I hear another study about FMS not predicting injury, I'm going to explode. I still love all you. This is Greg Rosen. Thanks for watching. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym of the Strength Coach, and today I have on PJ Nestler, and PJ is the Performance Director at XPT, which is a company owned by Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese. It's uh, Extreme Performance Training, uh, and he is a human performance specialist with over a decade of experience preparing top athletes for competition, and his mission is to help athletes and coaches realize their true potential. He's trained dozens of athletes from the UFC, NFL, NHL, and MLB, but his passion for combat sports and commitment to excellence has driven him to become a leader in combat sports performance training. He's worked extensively with over a hundred fighters, but we will talk a little bit about that later. And we're going to get into some of the uh, XPT stuff and his thoughts on breathing and movement and recovery. So, PJ, thanks for doing this. Hey, thank you very much for having me, Anthony. All right, well, let's get into. Some of the stuff, and one of the reasons and I talked to you about this already, I, I really love everything that Gabby and and uh, and and Laird were doing for a while. I've always followed them, and um, I, I like it. And I think so you and I did mention this the other day in our conversation about sometimes people from our community look outside and think, ah, oh, they're doing, you know, here's a couple of amazing athletes, and they're getting into the sports performance business, and uh, they're, they're doing some crazy stuff. But I think. 
Um, I don't think they're doing crazy stuff, first of all. And uh, second of all, I, I like their integrity. I like everything that they kind of stand for. But I like that you're – you know, you're part of this team because it, it's kind of, I don't want to say one of us, but it's kind of somebody from this kind of strength and conditioning world, performance world that's going into a little bit of the, of, of a little bit over outside the box with some of this stuff to get you on to talk about some of this stuff. Just before we get into it, talk to us about that transition for you kind of going and working with XPT. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> I agree. You know, I think for, as a performance coach, I was naturally very skeptical. I think anybody who looks from the outside, you know, we always want to be skeptical of things that look a little different than what we've seen backed in research or, or in our performance centers all the time. So uh, jumping into XPT, I was skeptical, but I try to just take it with an open mind because I know that, you know, these guys are swearing by some of the stuff they're doing. And I guarantee that there's benefit behind it. We just have to find the right prescription implementation. So, uh, you know, my experience was just kind of getting thrown into the fire. Uh, I went up and met with Laird and Gabby and they threw me into the pool and we did some pool training and all kinds of crazy stuff I'd never done before. And then I sat in the sauna with Laird for what seemed like two hours feeling like I was going to die. And then we went in the ice bath and, you know, talking to the people that were up there, uh, his friends and the people that come to these pool trainings uh, three days a week and people just swearing by the, the power that this has. And everybody had a different experience. Everybody talked about the benefits that they were experiencing from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, uh, from a community and group standpoint. So, you know, I left feeling like, man, this, this feels awesome. There has to be something there. Um, and the thing I loved about XPT was they weren't just saying, Hey, Laird Hamilton does this. So it's great. Everybody should do it. They were saying, you know, Laird's been exploring this stuff. Laird and Gabby have been exploring this stuff for a long time. They do a lot of this stuff, but we want to bring on some people who can help sort through what really works, uh, what it works for and what it doesn't work for, and you know how we can implement this for anybody, uh, not just extreme surfers or, or professional athletes, but you know how we can put this into place with other people. So that's why they brought me on, and that was my primary role. And we brought on a team of advisors from uh, Patrick McEwen on the breathing standpoint, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin is our exercise physiology advisor. And then, uh, you know, Kelly Starrett is our movement mobility advisor. So we, we brought on these people who are <clears throat> experts in their respective fields to help us sort through everything and create something that, that could be applicable and just really help under pe people understand why, you know, why are you doing that stuff? What is it useful for? What's it not useful for? Uh, so that we're not just standing back and saying, Hey, everyone should do this pool training. It'll benefit you in every way and you'll get all these benefits um, because we really want to help connect it to the performance community that are the natural skeptics and, and are looking for the research backing all of the methods that we're using. I think it's funny because the, the uh, tagline is kind of, you know, breathe, move, recover, which those are three words that are really kind of the hottest words in the industry, right? Because like over the last few years, and we've, we just had, uh, you know, Rob Wilson on talking all about the art of breath and the stuff that he's doing with Brian McKenzie. Um, I recently read Patrick McCune's book, um, The uh, Oxygen Advantage. Uh, so I've been really kind of getting into this stuff too. Breathing has become really popular in the industry. Everybody talks about, you know, moving well. Uh, the functional movement screen move well, move often, uh, but but more than that, a lot of people are talking about this idea about movement and recovery. Recovery has you know really gotten super popular, and and why I was like excited about getting you on is just to kind of go over those three because you know I'm on my own journey with the breath as well, and and you know I think a lot of people use the the excuse well I can't use it in groups or and and a lot of people just take a shortcut too right okay get get you on your back put your feet up do some of the, you know, just do some belly breathing at the end of the workout and you're done. Uh, or some people might do it in the beginning of a workout just to kind of get them, in, you know, set for the workout. But let's let's go talk about your approach to breathing and how you're incorporating it into uh, aspects of training and life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I was the same way when I first got introduced to breathing. It's like, what's this breathing stuff all about? Oh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Okay, we do a little bit after the workout or, you know, we do a little at the beginning maybe, but it's not really going to improve performance. I'm not seeing vertical jump numbers increasing, so I'm not really paying much attention to it. Um, 
which was very short sighted uh, and misguided and, and led me, you know, five years ago to only exploring breath a little bit. And then really three years ago, I started working with a, a friend of mine who's a breathing coach and learned so much more for myself personally, and then figured out how I can start implementing into my athletes training programs. Uh, and then of course, with getting on board with XPT, I went, I went all in uh, for the past year researching everything you could possibly imagine on breath work. Uh, and I just found that there's, you know, breathing, the reason I think the breathing thing is so powerful is because it's such a low hanging fruit. It, it can work for everybody. It can be implemented by everybody in any situation, in any walk of life, and it can improve a variety of different things from the way people feel from a disease standpoint to the way people recover from exercise to the way people perform during exercise, uh, <clears throat> you know, to a lot of, you know, we can actually use the breath as a variable to manipulate in training to create physiological adaptations that can improve athletic performance across a spectrum of different parameters. So, you know, there's so many different things we can use the breathing for. Um, but another reason, you know, just like when movement became really popular, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we saw that the fitness industry had been locked into these machines and everybody was just kind of going backwards, destroying their movement capabilities. And everybody was like, well, we just need to teach people how to move the right way and they'll be so much better off. Same thing goes for the breathing. So many people are doing it wrong that if we can just teach them how to do it the right way, they're going to see improvements across across the board in their life, whether that's in their work or in their exercise or in their play or in their their sleep, whatever those things are that they're looking to improve, improving your breathing can tie into all of those things. So, you know, that's why I think I jumped into it so quickly and, and started learning so much about it and then how it can be implemented into every single person's life to improve those things. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, let's, let's go deeper with the performance breathing. And that's something that XPT has even trademarked that were the, that combination performance breathing. And, and you guys talk about specialized breathing methods that heighten your oxygen levels and unlock your aerobic capacity to its fullest potential. Uh, and you have something called activate, perform and reset. But I, I want you to go over for, from the performance perspective, you know, what are we doing wrong and, and uh, how can we fix it? Yeah. So, so performance breathing is kind of what we is the overview that we use for all of our breathing methods. But <clears throat> when it comes to the activate perform reset, we broke them down into three buckets. You know, the activate breathing patterns are one, how we just teach people to breathe the right way on a baseline. And then two, uh, they're methods that we can use to stimulate energy, mental focus, clarity, uh, some of them to drive a little bit of a sympathetic response so that we can get people uh, energized. So those are methods you can use in the morning when you wake up, uh, before a big meeting or presentation or uh, before your workout. And then the stuff that falls into our perform category, those are really methods that we use uh, pre, during and post training. It, when I say training, I mean mostly you know gym training and um, methods that we can use on our own to create some adaptation. So stuff like Laird does, you know, Laird will put in 30 to 60 minute breathing sessions and that's the workout for the day. And, you know, we can create some physiological adaptations through these breathing methods. Uh, and then the reset, that's all, all of our down regulation type breathing. So stuff to bring you back down into a parasympathetic mode. Um, but from a perform standpoint, we're using a few different things, you know, with pre-training, we use some simple stuff to reset breathing patterns, you know, and <clears throat> one of the, the ones that I, I like to share with people because it's super simple and I hope that people listening can take this and go implement it into their workout. Um, I call it Superman breathing and you can do it standing, you can do it supine, depend on where you're kind of at in your breathing capabilities. I, I recommend people who've never done breathing before to, to just lay on their back because it's easier to control. But it's really just a simple reset that people can do before they train to get them out of maybe a stressed upper chest breathing pattern that maybe they've carried over from their work day or their anxiety. They woke up early to get their workout in and you know they're, they're already thinking about all the things they have to do for the day. So it's a, a physiological reset and, and I compare it to like um, neural patterning that we would do before we do a lift. You know, if I'm going to get in and I'm going to go through some sort of jump, 
I'll probably go through that same jump pattern with a little bit, you know, I'll pattern through the position, then I might improve the speed a little bit and the force, and then I'll get into my full power jumps uh, if it was a more complex pattern. So I do the same thing with breathing. I reset this pattern, get them breathing with their diaphragm back down into their belly, get them expanding their ribs out. So the reason it's called Superman breathing is they put their hands right in their lower ribs, kind of like a Superman stance. And then I have them breathe into that space. So thinking about expanding their ribs out laterally as they breathe and just using the hands as some tactile feedback to get the breath into that space. So I have them do that. My athletes will do that every single workout and we'll do 10 nose only breaths into the ribs. And then we'll do another pattern where we'll go in the nose, out the mouth and we'll do 10 more and we'll increase the speed a little bit. Again, just making sure that we're getting that into the belly and into the ribs and we're not, as soon as we start to pick up the pace and we involve the mouth, we're not kicking straight over into an upper chest breathing pattern because you're probably going to get into that nose mouth breathing at some point during your workout. So we want to start to reset that pattern even as we improve the speed. So that's all they do. Start off the workout. It takes less than two minutes, 10 slow nasal breaths into the belly and into the ribs and then 10 a little bit faster nose mouth in the nose out the mouth breaths um, and that's a very simple get in the gym and and the great part about it too is it it's 2 minutes where you're not talking to anybody you're not focused on anything else so your mind can get a little reset and it sets the tone for what you're about to do for the workout that day too Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let's talk. I like that you have uh, that in nose out mouth because sometimes uh, the uh, nose nose can be uh, it takes a while to learn that a little bit. It really does like when you're when your breathing starts to get a little bit heavy. And I know we're talking to Rob Wilson. Those guys like to do a lot of training, just nose breathing in and breathing out. And uh, that could be a, it could be a little tough in the in the beginning. So but let's talk about. In the workout, what are what will you guys recommend at that point? Or what are some of the different uh, protocols you guys have? Yeah, so we will use <clears throat> nose breathing only in some of our workouts to manipulate the breathing and to improve the uh, efficiency of breathing through the nose. Um, and then we'll also use breath holds. So we use breath, and this is more for my advanced athletes during certain exercises. And just like with anything, you've got to know what the the priority is. You know, I'm probably not going to incorporate breath holds into an extreme conditioning session because I'm not going to be able to push as hard. My, my overall workload is not going to be as high. Um, but through these breath holds, we've actually seen it in a lot of research. People can have a lot of uh, benefits. We, we've seen a performance increase in uh, cyclists and in, in elite swimmers and pretty actually ridiculous uh, results. That I think the elite swimmers, they did um, – they did breath holds during training for five weeks, um, and they improved their swim times. I think it was 3.7 seconds in the 100-meter sprint, um, 6.9 seconds in the 200-meter, and 13.6 seconds in the 400-meter. Wow. So pretty ridiculous performance improvements. And the only thing they added from the control group was they were using exhale holds, breath holds during swimming. Um, and we've started to see this in a bunch of different research. So I started incorporating that into some of my workouts as well with my athletes. And they think that the benefits are coming from improving acid buffering. You know, when we, when we do these anaerobic style uh, exercise, we start to build up lactic acid and hydrogen ions. And, um, you know, those eventually create fatigue. And we, we know now that lactic acid is not necessarily causing fatigue, but it is correlated with fatigue. Um, but that kind of acidosis, we start to build up and we start to fatigue these extreme breath holds. So when, when you get into an extreme breath hold, you get a, uh, hypercapnic, which is a high level of CO2 in the blood and a hypoxic, which is a low level of oxygen in the blood. You get a hypoxic hypercapnic response. Both of those things create these extra hydrogen ions. So you basically, your body has to work to clear those just like it would from the local, hydrogen ions that are building up in your quads from an intense, uh, you know, assault bike sprint. So what they kind of think in the research and what we've looked at is, is we believe that there are, these athletes are actually systemically able to clear these hydrogen ions quicker. So not only just local to the muscle, but also systemically in the body. Uh, and therefore they're able to buffer that acid a little bit better. 
and that's leading to improved performance in some of these more anaerobic uh, type exercises. So that's something I've been incorporating in with, with my elite athletes, my fighters, but it's pretty tough. You know, when doing a breath hold on an exhale is pretty hard anyway. Uh, doing a breath hold on an exhale when you're doing some sort of intense exercise, it's, it's pretty tough. So you have to kind of get athletes to that point where they can start to build this stuff up and, and understand it. And that's a big thing that, uh, our pool training does our, our water training produces those exact results in this hypoxic environment, hypoxic hypercapnic environment with some unique methods. So, uh, from a perf- an elite performance standpoint, those are some of the physiological adaptations that we're just starting to see. Uh, you know, that research study was done in 2016. So we're just starting to see this stuff come out. Um, but I think that there's going to be a lot more benefit to it. Yeah. Well, give us an example, of like, uh, like how you would use it when, like in a certain exercise, what exact exercise and how you would use it. Yeah. So we can use it, you know, I'll usually use it in a, a lower threshold circuit type exercise. So maybe in a conditioning circuit where, for example, kettlebell swings and I'll give them specific, I'll either cue them on breath holds or I'll give them a specific number of swings they're trying to do on a certain number of breaths. Um, and you can do that with any type of exercise, but it, it's easier to use on cyclical type movements where there's not a ton of thinking that goes into it. Uh, cause they're, they're going to lose focus on everything else that's going on as soon as they start holding their breath. So what I'll have them do is I'll incorporate these breath holds and I just have them go maximum on the breath hold. And then the goal is to try to recover their breathing as fast as possible in between. So they may do a, a 30 second or 60 second interval, uh, not at super, super high intensity because the adding a breath hold to a max effort interval is not really going to work, uh, unless you've really built up the capacity. But at maybe a, you know, a 75% intensity, and um, we'll just incorporate that. In. And it might be short. You know, a lot of these breath holds are somewhere between eight to 15 seconds. And yeah. the goal is during the rest of that set, they need to recover their breathing, usually through the nose, as fast as possible. And then we'll just incorporate a few of those throughout our workout. Um, and again, where I use them the most is in the pool, because I we have access to this. XPT water training and pool training. That's an opportunity where I get to use this stuff in a, in a more unique environment. And then it doesn't take away from any of the training I'm doing in the gym. Okay. Excellent. Well, let's move on to move the move part. And I wanted to see what your, you know, what your curriculum for movement looks like. Cause you guys do do a lot of stuff in the pool and a lot of us don't have that access to that, but talk to us about what that curriculum looks like and, and how it can be replicated maybe in, in another place. Our, the movement section that we teach at our certifications is really pretty simple. You know, we're not taking a, a major stance on how people should train in terms of their, what method they choose, whether it's endurance running or CrossFit or whatever, really our, our move section is aimed on creating the most versatile and resilient human beings possible. So a lot of people who come to us are more executives, uh, you know, business people. And the goal for them is to restore foundational movement patterns from a basic standpoint, like squat, hinge, push, pull, twist, carry, and then more athletic based movements like skip, shuffle, run, backpedal, jump and land, throw, and really restoring those kind of things and, and teaching people to understand where the uh, where the weaknesses lie and not allowing those to become – Laird likes to say all the time, don't be a liability. And what he means by that is cr- be as versatile as possible. Now, if you have a specialized goal, if you want to you know run an ultra marathon, you've got to spend more time training for that specifically if you want to get that result. But what we tell people a lot is, you know, a lot of us get into these uh, single dimension fitness pursuits or, or narrowly focused fitness pursuits. So if it's CrossFit, that's all I do. I just CrossFit, CrossFit, CrossFit all the time. If it's powerlifting, that's all I do. I just lift heavy weights all the time. And because of that, we lose our versatility. And then, you know, I'm supposed to be super fit because I'm a power lifter and I train five days a week. But when I go play pickup basketball with my friends, I blow my ankle out because I have no ability to move my body outside of those patterns that I'm, I'm using. So that's really the simplicity that we bring to the movement standpoint. Um, and really the pool training is just an extra bonus on top. So we add the pool is where we add the breathe, move, recover components 
all together. You know, those are the three pillars of XPT and they all combine in the pool training. <clears throat> and that's where we can really work on some specific movement patterns under less load because we're in, we're underwater. Um, and we can move the body in a lot of unique ways that we can't do on land again, because of the, the pressure of the water and the uh, unloading of the water. But a lot of what we do in the pool is combining the breath work, whether that's breath holds or specific types of breath work, um, into that kind of training. And then we use the pool a lot for recovery as well for a recovery workout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give me an idea, like some beginners come in, uh, what the, what you're going to use the pool with kind of like an athlete, but, uh, but you know, somebody who's really hasn't done any of this pool training yet, uh, how are you guys starting them out? And what are some of the things that you're going to be doing with them? Yeah. So beginners, we usually start a lot of people in the shallow pool stuff. Uh, you know, people see the cool backflips and things that, that Laird's doing in the deep pool, but that's a little bit more advanced. Um, but we have a lot of shallow water exercises that we incorporate, and it's a lot of it is swimming with weights and including breath holds. So, for example, we have an, an exercise called the ammo box, um, and I think Laird invented it after watching or or talking to soldiers about how they would swim across rivers carrying, you know, a 25 pound uh, ammo can or ammo box. So it's basically swimming with a dumbbell. So you're holding a dumbbell to your chest and you're swimming across the pool. And we teach people how to be efficient in the water and then ultimately how to be relaxed. And that's where a big benefit from some of this stuff comes because I get athletes who come in, you know, again, I train fighters. So they come in and they want to attack everything and they have to do a breath hold to the other side and back. They want to go as hard as they can to get there. And what they learn really quickly is you're going to burn out way, way more fuel than is going to be made up for the extra speed. So you have to learn how to be efficient in some of these movements. So we have a few unique exercises that we incorporate. One of them is that ammo box um, in the shallow water. And then we just get people comfortable going through those things. And we compound, we start to compound those movements by adding less breaths per set, uh, less recovery breaths. So we may use the variable of try to get to the other side and back on one breath and then only 10 breaths to recover before you do your next exercise. Uh, or we may add, you know, harder compounding exercises like a freestyle sw sprint there and back and then get into these movements. So now we've already increased your heart rate. We've increased your respiratory rate. Now you have to find a way to be able to relax and stay, stay smooth and efficient, uh, during these times. Yeah, we've got some basic ballistic exercise that we can do in like moderate water, uh, you can't do them in the super shallow, like three foot pool, but we can do them in, you know, a six to eight foot pool. Uh, and there are simple things like different types of squat jumps with load, um, but allowing people to get a real good concentric force production. And then we deload a ton of the eccentric forces coming down and allow them to get in good position. So that's why it's a great one for recovery as well, because there's not much eccentric load, but they can still get a lot of blood flow to those areas by the concentric force production. Um, we're incorporating breath. So they're actually jump to the surface, get a breath, sink back down and they get this kind of cyclical, uh, explosive movement into relaxation, into a breath, relax back into the next thing, get set up and do it again. Um, and we use a, a few different ballistic exercises like that in the same uh, sense. Very interesting. Now, how much, you know, you're again coming from a, you're a strength and conditioning guy, but you know, by trade and, and, you know, spent a lot of time in the weight room. How much now has that had to take over the swimming, the pool work and, uh, kind of had to take away from the, uh, the gym work and how much gym work do you really do now? Uh, I mean, the gym work is still my priority. I, I work with athletes and they need to improve performance that's going to translate into the cage. So the pool work for us is really a recovery day where we can still get some benefit. Um, we can use it as an active recovery and, you know, we can still create some, we can get a, a respiratory muscle workout. We can improve some of these breath hold capabilities, which again can trigger some of those um, anaerobic adaptations that we discussed earlier. Um, and one of the biggest things with it that I didn't even realize or put a lot of uh, validation on until I started in, in introducing this stuff to my fighters is the psychological benefit of this, of the pool. Um, because you're a lot of people, especially fighters, they can push themselves 
through a brick wall and through another brick wall. I mean, they, they fight people for two straight hours. So to find something that pushes them to the point of the mental, I can't do this, like I can't complete this, it just doesn't exist in their world. And if you could find it, you would break them down so bad physically that it wouldn't be worth it. But when we put them in the pool, they find that wall really quickly. And I think that's where the people from these that come to our experiences and that go through this pool training, some of the biggest magic that they leave with is they find that I can't do this wall. And then they have to use positive psychology, affirmations, relaxation. They have to use all this stuff to overcome that. And when they overcome those obstacles, I mean, my fighters, they hate it before they go in and then they love it afterwards because they're able to overcome these things without putting any real physical load on their body. Um, but we're using it once a week yeah. when the pool, and we use it on our, on our recovery days on Saturdays because the gym is still our priority. That's still where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of specificity and, and transferability. Excellent. Let's move on to recovery. And I liked some of the things you said. You have a video, uh, things you're doing wrong. <laughs> and uh, recovery uh, was one of them. And I like what you said. Only training that is beneficial is training I can recover from. And, you know, we don't plan enough. You know, other than like people have all, yeah, we have deload weeks. And uh, like I said before, make people either breathe before or after. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, like I said to you before, too, is I think uh, some of the excuse will be like, well, some of this stuff isn't accessible for groups. Talk to us about your philosophy on recovery and then trying to plan this recovery and how you do that. Yeah. So the philosophy on recovery is really based on the ultimately is, is mostly getting people into a parasympathetic state, you know, from from high powered executives to military populations that we work with to elite athletes. Uh, if everybody, our, our entire world, the whole fitness industry has gone really hard towards high intensity exercise. And people want to do that every single day because, you know, everything now is high intensity, high intensity, high intensity. And then they live their whole lives in that sympathetic state. And, uh, you know, I've heard you talk about this before and, and plenty of other people. So that's really step one for us is getting people some awareness of how to pull themselves back down out of that state. And we can utilize a ton of different methods to do that. You know, people look at the ice bath and they want to know what are the physiological adaptations from that. But a big benefit of the ice bath is the parasympathetic rebound when you get out. It drives this sympathetic response and then you get this parasympathetic rebound in blood pressure and the unique blood flow to all these different, um, you know, to your extremities. But all that stuff when you get out, that's really one of the big benefits why people recover better when they utilize ice baths uh, after training. You know, there's other benefits to it as well. But same thing with the sauna. Sauna can get you into this parasympathetic state. Now, if you go too far, it can actually attenuate the parasympathetic response because you 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 start to stress your system a lot and your your uh, core temperature stays really high afterwards. You've got to be able to cool yourself off and bring yourself back down. But that's another big benefit to utilizing the sauna or the breath work or the pool training. You know, we 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 utilize all these different things, and a lot of the benefit is getting people into a parasympathetic state and teaching them how to turn it on and turn it off when they need to. Um, and then there's a bunch of obviously specific local recovery type things like getting blood flow to clear out, you know, metabolic waste or, or anything else that's been built up from high intensity exercise. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, I think the problem with recovery is everybody waits until they beat themselves to hell to like, oh, maybe I should probably try to do something. Um, so that's kind of step one with my fighters, especially, and, and all of the higher level athletes that we worked with was we plan their recovery just like we plan their training sessions. So I look at what their week looks like and then I say, okay, here's what we're doing. Monday, Tuesday, we're doing blah, blah, blah. Wednesday's our recovery day. Here's what we're doing in the morning. Here's what we're doing at night. Uh, and then after our workouts, cause my guys train twice, two or three times a day. So after our workouts, we're doing some recovery breathing, uh, or we're doing some foam rolling, some soft tissue work, whatever we're going to do. So we plan that stuff out so that it's not a, you know, people will plan their workouts for the week and then recovery becomes a, a side note. So I think planning that stuff out just allows you to stay ahead of it and not wait until you're already beating yourself to death. And, it, and you're so far in the hole 
that whatever method you use is probably not going to dig you back out. So that's really what we use in terms of planning that recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, talk to us about you guys have what, on your website called Fire and Ice Methodology. And uh, you guys uh, say you're turning up the, the furnace internally with heat application followed by the cold water ice immersion. I see, like, if you go on any of, like, uh, you know, your social medias, uh, always showing people in the ice baths. <laughs> so um, talk to me about uh, how you're using the heat and the cold together, not just with uh, kind of uh, the contrast training. Yeah, so we use – I mean, we use them separate of each other, and then we use them together to, as a contrast uh, really, the main reason for the contrast, one of them is is the blood flow that it creates from the, the vasoconstriction when you're in the ice bath to the dilation when you're in the heat and, and going back and forth. That creates a lot of systemic blood flow that can you know increase recovery, get that blood flow to the areas that need it, clear out any of the um, waste products that are built up from from beating yourself up. Uh, but when we also use the the contrast to increase the adherence to either of the other methods. So especially when it comes to the ice, people don't want to do three rounds in the ice bath. Uh, like we, we do three rounds in a, about three minutes in an ice bath and our ice baths are about 25 degrees colder than most ice baths that people do. So most of the time people dump a few bags of ice in some cold water and it's probably about 55 to 60 degrees and they stay in there for five to 10 minutes. Um, and most of the research on ice baths at that temperature is more like showing benefits for people who stay in there for an hour, which is just not realistic. So that's a big reason that we go as, you know, when it comes to heat, uh, any type of thermal stress, it's always a, it's always a dose, um, dose response that you're looking at. So if you want to go in the heat and you want to know how long you should stay in there, it really depends on how hot, the hotter it is, the, the less time you probably need to stay in there to get some of the benefit. And then same thing for the cold. So we use the heat a lot of times just to get people to warm back up so that they can go into two or three rounds uh, in the 32 to 36 degree ice baths that we use. Um, <clears throat> but those will create, again, physiological uh, recovery response, and, and a lot of it comes from that blood flow. Uh, and there's a ton of benefit showing everything from improved. Obviously, one of the big reasons people use ice baths is, is delayed onset muscle soreness, and there's a ton of research behind utilizing ice baths for uh, improving that uh, perceptions of muscle soreness a few days after any type of event, strength training, endurance training. <clears throat> and then from a uh, systemic standpoint, we get that blood flow. You know, and, and I started noticing too, uh, and what I think there could be a huge benefit, we haven't seen it yet in research, because of the, the constriction of all the blood vessels and the blood being pooled in the thoracic cavity when you're in these 32 degree ice baths submerged up to your neck, uh, I think that there could be a lot of benefit to people who have, you know, certain issues in maybe the liver or, you know, the organs because of the blood flow that's being directed to those areas, just like it would be for my knee if I was using, you know, hot cold therapy on my knee because I just banged my knee into something or I've got some kind of injury and we get that blood flow that's clearing out all those waste products. So we haven't seen that in research yet, but those are some of the benefits that I think, uh, aren't far away, um, but people just haven't really been studying this stuff on a consistent basis yet. You know, the, the protocols are all over the place in the research, uh, but that's what we're using it for, as well as to create physiological adaptations. You know, when, when you push yourself in some of these extreme environments, you can get adaptations to the heat and to the cold. So we use those not only just for recovery, but to create psychological and physiological uh, adaptations. Now, is uh, not a waste of time, but like, for example, you talked about those ice baths being 55 to 60. Are, are people wasting their time with those? Um, probably. You know, if you're, if you're in a 60-degree ice bath and you're staying in there for five minutes, you're probably not getting much of a benefit because without stress to the system, there's no adaptation. Your body doesn't need to send signals to create a response if you're not creating stress. It's just like exercise. A lot of the research on those ice baths that, that show benefits are a lot longer, you know, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. A lot of them are 60 minutes in those, in those uh, warmer ice baths. So I would say 
possibly wasting their time, but there's also a big caveat to that. And that is when people feel that they've received a beneficial treatment, it improves recovery. So, you know, that's one of the things with cryo versus people talk about cryo versus ice bath. That's a question I get all the time. We use ice baths because in the research, they're shown to be more beneficial than cryo in, in a whole bunch of different areas. And it, and it comes down to cryo just doesn't lower your core body temperature, anything like an ice bath does because of the, the poor conductivity of the air. But if you are going to do cryo only and you're, you were never going to do an ice bath anyway, and you believe the cryo makes you feel better, then do the cryo because it will actually improve your recovery uh, if you believe that it's, it's having that benefit. And that's one of the, the major things we've seen with this stuff. And, you know, we don't try to be uh, <clears throat> one dimensional in kind of what we say, like, it's got to be a 32 degree ice bath for three minutes. And it, we're just like, go get really hot sometimes, go get really cold sometimes, see how you feel when you do those things. And then keep pushing yourself into situations that are slightly outside your comfort zone. So if you're in the heat, stay a little longer than you're comfortable. When you're in the cold, push yourself a little bit longer than you're comfortable. And those will probably start to create some responses, even if it's just a psychological payoff, but that can be huge and, and can trigger physiological responses. Very interesting. I love it. I, you know, I've been doing these kind of freezing cold showers. Obviously they're not ice baths, but it's like when it's the first thing that you do when you wake up at, you know, five o'clock in the morning, uh, there's something to getting out of there and just feeling really good and uh, feeling like you did something that kind of isn't fun, but I'm kind of addicted to them now too. Whereas I can't even take a hot shower anymore. It's really weird. I'm just, you know, I shave in the shower and I do it and then I'm like, so I, but I have to start with the cold and then I do, uh, I do the hot shower just to shave and then I go back to the cold. It's, it's really weird. I didn't think it would get like this, but, uh, it's something that I'm getting addicted to and I'm trying to get into the ice baths as well. But you know, obviously it's more, a, a little bit more work. Yeah. And I'm the exact same way. And it, that's the big thing is we tell people like, don't negate the psychological benefits that you're getting from these things. Cause people love to, especially us as strength coaches, we love to excuse those and say, well, yeah, people felt better, but who cares if, if it wasn't proven in science to create this physiological change, then it's not important. And then that's just really misguided because you know, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin talks a lot about, uh, sometimes you just need to choose suffering and, get outside of just the convenience and choose suffering means like, yeah, just take that freezing cold shower for a minute in the morning and see how you feel because you'll feel better. You, that's not going to create the same physiological changes that an ice bath will. You're probably not taking advantage of those, but there's research showing people using cold showers to improve depression just because it makes people the, just because of the way it makes people feel. So the psychological payoff from some of these things is really not to be ignored. Um, and that's a big thing that we discuss and that we kind of promote is just getting outside your comfort zone and doing things that make you uncomfortable every once in a while, because you're either optimizing your whole life or you're adapting. And if you're, if you're always optimizing, then you're not progressing. So you have to be kind of playing with that back and forth and finding ways to optimize your life, your performance, all of those things, and then finding ways to stress the system and push yourself out of that comfort zone so that you can be adapting and, and actually progressing. Good stuff. Well, let's finish up with, uh, cause we didn't talk about recovery breathing and since we're in the recovery section of the uh, conversation, how do you guys use breathing for, uh, for recovery? Yeah, we, we use breathing again to, to stimulate a parasympathetic response. And we use it. I use it at the end of every training session. It's probably the biggest, one of the biggest things, uh, the biggest beneficial thing that I've introduced with my athletes in the past three, four years um, that that just clicks with people. They feel great afterwards and they love it. And I don't have to tell them to do it anymore. Uh, something I do every single day. I, I don't have a formal breathing practice where I wake up and just breathe for 60 minutes. Uh, but I do my recover. I do breathe before I work out. I do my recovery breathing after I work out. And I incorporate the same stuff in stressful situations. Uh, I do it a lot when I'm in L.A. traffic. Um, so what we do is we take advantage of as many parasympathetic triggers as possible. So, and you mentioned at the beginning, getting supine, putting your feet up on the wall in 90, 90 position. So getting in, you know, flexion based positions are, are parasympathetic in nature. 
And then what I use is a simple cadence breath of a one to two ratio, inhale versus exhale. So elongating the exhales is a parasympathetic trigger. If we can get the exhale more than seven seconds, another parasympathetic trigger. We go all through the nose, nasal breathing, another parasympathetic trigger. Nasal breathing also helps activate the diaphragm. Diaphragmatic breathing, another parasympathetic trigger. So we're just taking advantage of as many of these triggers as we possibly can. Um, and we do this, you know, again, if, you, if you're doing this in the car, you're obviously not going to lay supine and close your eyes. But I do the same breathing pattern. And then following the breath is a major thing to get their mind off of the workout or any other stress. Um, so what I like to start people off with, de depending on their capabilities, maybe a three to a three, six ratio. So three second inhale, just a brief hold at the top and a slow six second exhale. And then if they're able to go a little further, I like to get them to four, eight, cause we're taking advantage of just one more parasympathetic trigger, which is that seven plus second exhale. Uh, and then I'll have them do that for three minutes. The, sh the shortest one I do is three minutes. So really my guys are doing five minutes of focused breath work in their entire workout, two minutes at the beginning, three minutes at the end. Uh, and everybody's got five minutes that they can throw into their workout to get a better workout and then to recover better from it. Um, and then you can play with that as long as just keep that ratio. You can go five seconds in 10 seconds out, six in 12 out. And I like to have my guys kind of play with it once they're comfortable and they understand it because it helps keep their mind focused. So they just set a timer, they close their eyes, and it just helps keep their mind on the breath the whole time and not kind of lose track of it. So that's what I do personally. I'll, I'll start with four, eight, and then I might bump up to six, 12, and then I might come back to five, 10, and, and just kind of play around with the breathing and just always making sure it's, it's nice and controlled, it's all through the nose, and it's all into the belly. Uh, and then sometimes I also like to do a, a hissing exhale. Um, I learned that from a breathing coach who uh, said it's another parasympathetic trigger. And, and I just really like that one. I feel better. I feel like I'm dumping out more stress and anxiety and stuff when I, when I exhale slowly through my mouth in a hissing exhale. So that's, um, that's one of our recovery breathing protocols and that, that's our post-workout recovery breathing protocol. Uh, but you can also use it anytime after a stressful situation to kind of stimulate that parasympathetic response and get you into that rest and digest, uh, recovery mode. Love it. Excellent. Uh, so much, so many, uh, great, interesting things and, and, uh, just making it practical for us. So, uh, PJ, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your experience and, and talking about some of the things that you guys are doing uh, over at XPT and some of the things you're doing with your fighters. So, uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, man. Hey, thank you very much for having me. It's always fun talking about all of this stuff. So this, this is my life, so I enjoy sharing it. All right, that's going to do it for episode 232 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Parry and the folks over at Perform Better. Right now, they have free shipping on orders over $59. Restrictions do apply, so check out the site for more info. The summits are here. I'm speaking this week in Orlando, but after that, you got Providence in June. Chicago in July and Long Beach in August. You can check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and PJ Nestler for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, and performance enhancement. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to Train Heroic and start your 14-day free trial. Let them know I sent you or the Strength Coach Podcast sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Edition. Thanks to Alan Cosgrove and the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Greg Rose and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. And remember, of course, you can try StrengthCoach.com out for three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to StrengthCoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Randa. Go to ContinueFit.com to see all of my stuff. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.